Where there is no vision, the people perish. And in that light, I'd like us to look at two portions of scripture tonight. First in Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18, beginning in verse 24. The first mention of Apollos, who later was an apostle, used to help build the church in Corinth. Now a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the scriptures. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus, being acquainted only with the baptism of John. And he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wanted to go across to Achaia, the brethren encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he had arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. And then just a portion in Revelation chapter 1. In the middle, we'll pick up of this vision of Jesus that the Apostle John saw there on the Isle of Patmos. Beginning verse 16. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. And I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of, Hades, of death and of Hades. Therefore, write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. As for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write. And we will stop there for the moment. Our Father, we come to you tonight after a full day of fellowship and ministry. So thankful for your mercies to us. And once again, we apply to you and ask that you would quicken us, body, soul, and spirit. As we're in your presence, refresh us. And help us to receive your will, your life, your light. We're thankful to be together. Oh, Lord, do make this a profitable time for all of us. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. The uh, matter I wanted to share on in my times is this matter of ministry out of heavenly vision. And I imagine that all of you know that this reference comes from Acts chapter 26, where Paul is talking to King Agrippa, and he says, O king, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Heavenly vision is the matter we're talking about tonight. Praise God we're all together as members of the body of Christ. This is the body of Christ, and we're individually members of it. And each of us have in our membership some grace to give to build up the body of Christ. When we talk about this matter of being a servant of the Lord, the reference turns actually to our also being involved as servants of the king in his kingdom. And as Peter reminded us there in chapter 2, that which was spoken to Moses back in Exodus, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, 
that you might give praise to him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So on the one hand, we're members of the body of Christ to share life with one another and allow the body to grow by itself in love. But the Lord's also looking to those who would be faithful servants, servants of the Lord in his kingdom. And this brings us into a little larger sphere because this not only has to do with us serving little ways like cooking in the kitchen, as we heard this afternoon, but even in the greater ways having to do with ministry that builds the church, uh, those different ministries that travel, and our service even in the church in preaching the gospel and in standing in prayer as we pray for the kingdom of God to come on earth. So there's a dimension there of being servants of the Lord that I think sometimes I wish were emphasized more. And especially because in this last day, we're dealing with a situation in the Laodicean church where so many who are servants of the Lord are serving in a lukewarmness and out of the riches of the internet and not out of a heart that is heard from the Lord. And because we don't realize, because the church doesn't realize in these last days that we're poor, wretched, blind, naked, we actually think the church is doing well. I wonder what percentage of messages do come from the internet. As one brother said he cheated, got one off the internet. We have devotions every day in our fellowship in Manhattan, and every once in a while I read something, and I say, boy, that guy picked that right out of the internet. <laughs> you know? Well, the internet is your new pastor. But the Lord's looking for something more. Servants who know him, the old-fashioned way, talking to him, not going to books or going to the internet and all of this kind of thing. There are many ministers, pastors, workers, teachers, elders, deacons, but I want to speak tonight about us holding to the standard of the heavenly vision. All of you are servants of the Lord or you wouldn't be here. And we're thankful that every servant of the Lord has to go through the same school of Christ. He is the teacher. And one way or another, we will learn the lessons of the school of Christ. Maybe you're in the classroom with Christ, our high priest, still learning that your sins are forgiven by his precious blood. But you know, our high priest is waiting for something. And that is our full consecration where we present our bodies as a living sacrifice before him, the high priest, and our members as instruments of righteousness. Because when we consecrate ourselves to that high priest, then the fire comes down and the Holy Spirit empowers our life. It's so important to go to that classroom of the high priest and learn how to serve him in the power of the Holy Spirit. But we also have another class. Um, oh, that's Jesus the Master. And this is the Yoke Fellow class. And in this class, we learn from Christ how to work with him in, our, in a yoke where he is in one side and we are in the other. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. There's so much to learn. And his way is usually not our way. And so there's a, hu a humiliating, a humbling process in learning how to serve the Lord with the Lord in your yoke. But it's a good class to be in, the class of the master, because he's so humble in heart. And he'll give rest to your spirit as you learn from him in this way. But of course, everyone also has to go to the classroom in the school of Christ, of Christ crucified. And in that class, we learn that our flesh avails nothing. We learn that our best efforts, even our best noble efforts, will not get there. But we learn how to uh, see and recognize that we need to live out of Christ crucified, out of his victory, out of that resurrection life that comes when we've been crucified with Christ. 
And this is such an important lesson for God's servants because today, in, 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 I'm talking about in ministry at large, there's many servants of God who are getting absolutely burned out before they're 50 years old. Their energy is expended trying to serve God's people out of their own strength. It's an impossibility. So it's a good thing that we're in, these, in the school of Christ, isn't it? And no matter what classroom you go into, there, there he is again. <laughs> it's the same Lord who wants to teach you. He's very jealous about teaching his servants how to serve. And so we can expect to find him in every class. So just before we go any further, I just want to ask you a question. Have you really owned up to being his bondservant? Or are you a volunteer? You remember how Jesus said, a good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, but a volunteer, when tough times comes, he jumps over the fence and takes off. There's a lot of Christians who love the Lord, but I don't know if they really owned up to the fact, I am a bond servant of Jesus Christ, and whatever he says, I will do. And until we own up to that fact and aren't ashamed of it, oh, we, we, we tremble to say I'm a bond servant of Jesus Christ because only Paul says things like that. We feel like we're not worthy to say it. But that's our position. Do we own it? Do we stand humbly in it? I remember one time, back several years ago now, our brother Lance Lambert came to Manhattan. and We were a scrawny little group, of, I don't know, 25 or 30. And he spoke to us so mercifully and wonderfully, spoke about the Word of God. Afterwards, we're standing around, and I happened to be over there near Lance, and one of our young guys came over. Now, you know, it's the young people have the freedom not to respect older people. And this young guy came by, and he was being a little bit of a wise guy. And he says, uh, so uh, what do you do when you're not preaching? I mean, what's your real job? <laughs> Lance got quickly serious, and his face flushed. And you know what he said? I'm a servant of the Lord. And he said it with a kind of a strength that almost blew the kid back over. Of course, the kid was just being a wise guy. But Lance was being deadly serious. And it turned out he didn't have many years to live before he went to glory. But he stood as a servant of the Lord. That's what he called himself. Not an apostle, teacher. I'm a servant of the Lord. Now, have we owned up to that? Have you owned up to that? There comes a time in our lives... Maybe you don't know what your calling is exactly, but has that calling reached to the heart? Because a crisis surely will come in your life, just like it came into the life of the disciples, where they said, out of duress, Lord, we've got nowhere else to go. You alone have the words of life that we need. Where else can we go? You remember when the disciples said that? That was a major uh, road marker. There's no going back once you say that. Now you're connected to the Lord and we press on. So this is my question to you. Have you owned the fact that you're a bondservant of the Lord? Not a volunteer. Not even a part-timer. Because when we talk about this matter of being a servant of the Lord, somehow in our minds we go back and think, well, now he's talking about full-time guys, full-time ministers. But no. Every child in the kingdom is also a servant in the kingdom. And no matter how little the service may be, when it's done with all your heart, you receive the reward of a good and faithful servant. So have you owned it? If the young people in your church say to you, who, who, who are you? Do you say, I'm a servant of the Lord? Maybe we need to recover this. Not be embarrassed by it. Because when we're really a servant of the Lord... My, my, how he loves us. So your calling to be a servant of the Lord is what we're talking about here tonight as we begin. And the calling is much more difficult for you than it was for me. And so I'm going to have to share a little bit of my story. Actually, it's God's mercy that I'm even here talking to you. Because I came from such a different place than I feel like most of you came from. You know, I grew up born in Brooklyn and grew up out on Long Island. 
My dad, my mom and dad, they weren't believers. My dad was a psychiatrist. My mom was an opera singer. And I grew up in, in a very proud household. And of course, bloomed out of the three children that they had, I was the proudest of them all. I was very popular in school, I was popular in sports, popular class president kind of thing, I was popular in the drama club, I was popular with music, I, I was just popular. <laughs> I knew I was about the best person in the high school, I wasn't sure, but when I went off to college, sure enough, I was popular in college. I was just full of pride and full of myself and full of foolishness. <laughs> Well, it's too much of a story to tell you how I met up with my foolish wife, <laughs> who was a backslidden Christian, and married me, a non-Christian. But in the mercy of God, she had wonderful, godly parents. And basically, her dad led me to the Lord. And then uh, I saw my mom get saved, and then I saw my dad get saved, and then I saw my brother get saved, and finally my sister get saved. It's, it's just total mercy. I mean, while they're getting saved, I'm still smoking two packs of cigarettes a day, still got a kind of a untamed tongue, still very proud. But the Lord, see, he has to take some people who are the vilest offender who truly believes. He has to set a couple of them up for an example. You know? Because all of you are the goody, goody, goodies who got saved because you found out you were a sinner. I knew I was a sinner, <laughs> but I didn't know that the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus, a pardon receives. Well, well, so just to get the ball started. So I was saved in the context of a denomination. That is, I was a Southern Baptist. That's what my father-in-law was. That's what my wife was. That's therefore what I became. It was easy for me to f hear my calling, which I heard about a year after I became a Christian, and I started preaching a year and a half after I was a Christian. I was a pastor two years after I was a Christian, because they set you up. If you say you're called, they ordain you. You go off to a seminary, you study, you learn. By the time I got through with seminary, I became a missionary. Now, this may sound strange to you, but to the Southern Baptist. If they're going to send somebody up to New York, it's mission territory. <laughs> and so they made me a missionary. My wife and I went through all of the stuff. They screwed a halo on my head. I was Reverend Dana Congdon. And I, they, uh, so what they do is they uh, kind of, uh, I don't know what you say, send out the missionary. And so the yeah, Southern Baptist Convention has a convention of 15,000 people every year. It's like the Democratic Convention or something like that. And I was one of the speakers. I was a young man of promise. I, I don't know what happened, but I had become a pastor and a, a lot of people got saved. So you know what I mean. That, that makes you a hero in the Baptist book. So it was easy for me to know the calling because there's a simple denominational way. And here you are, and nobody's telling you you're a pastor. Nobody's sending you to school. You're having to hear from the Lord. You're having to obey his voice. You're having to ask God for grace to serve for no money. I got paid. I see the brothers, the responsible brothers in, 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 in our fellowship. And, you know, I, you couldn't pay me for that job. And they don't get paid. <laughs> and they spend a lot of time praying and talking to people and everything, you see. So, uh, you don't have an outward position that has to be undone. You're going to have to learn all of these things from inside out. But you see, here's what I've discovered. And I've been around a long time now. Not as long as some. <laughs> but I've been around a long time. And this is my conclusion. The Lord didn't make a mistake. His training school to raise up servants of God is the house of God. Because there you will truly find and discover your calling and your gifts and your heart. And you give to the Lord out of, out of your love for the Lord. This is a much better way than going off to seminary. And getting out of seminary with a ministerial mindset that you're the leader. And everybody's going to follow you and all such kind of stuff. So this is very important for us to come to. But you see, my burden is to share on this matter of the necessity of a heavenly vision 
for ministry today. Now, I did inwardly sense that calling of God, and I guess as it turned out, he, he was calling me, although I misunderstood and went this way and that for a while. But the Lord was calling me, but I had no heavenly vision. I had basically what you would call a Baptist vision. For every group, every organized church has a, a sort of a vision, the way they do things, what they believe, their parameters, and and uh, much of it was scriptural, uh, you know, I was a pastor, I was an evangelist, I ministered the word, we, we, we stressed evangelism. And even as a young Baptist pastor, I read some good literature. I remember, I was in this Baptist church, I couldn't have been a Christian for half a year. And there was a guy, a, kind of a strange guy, who came to the back of the church, you know. He, he, sat, he wore a trench coat all year long, summertime, wintertime, same old trench coat. And one day I walked out after a service, just a brand new Christian. He comes like this. He opens his trench coat and says, here, i got some books for you. <laughs> and this guy, I was six months old as a Christian and go, still going to college. And he gave me normal Christian church life by Watchman Nee. I have never been so blessed by a book in all my life. When I saw that... Immediately, I said, well, that's the way it should work out. That's the way the church, look, because everything he said, he, he gave scripture for. It was a lot different than the Baptist way, you know, as I saw it. I, I got a lot of good teaching. I went to Keswick's, if you know what that is, and, and heard the teachings on the deeper life. By the time I was a Christian for two, three years, I already knew this matter. I'd been crucified with Christ, and Christ was living in me. I, I mean, I, 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 was, I was so blessed by the environment that I was in, hearing all these things, kind of doing all the things, but I had a problem. And it was a problem, and that's why I'm using Apollos as an example. I am nothing like Apollos, but we did have one thing in common, a limited vision. Now let me give you an example, because let's just look at Apollos. While Paul went back to Jerusalem, Priscilla and Aquila landed in Ephesus, and open their home to fellowship and people passing by, all this kind of thing. At that time, Paul hadn't started work in Ephesus. There was no church there, per se. The believers met in a synagogue. And sure enough, one Sabbath, along came Apollos. What a mighty preacher of Jesus. He came in that synagogue and stirred things up. He had a reputation for doing this. He was mighty in Scripture. And he was, had eloquence, and he preached the gospel, and, and people got saved. It was a wonderful thing. I, Priscilla and Aquila were so glad to hear him preach, but when they heard him preach, they knew something was missing. It could have been some things very obvious, just as an example. He only knew the baptism of John. Very possibly, these new converts to Jesus the Messiah, he may have baptized them in John's baptism. And he probably, they said, well, what do we do now? And he says, go back to the synagogue and worship Jesus, your Messiah, and tell them about Jesus, the Messiah. Now, when Aquila and Priscilla heard him preach the gospel, maybe Apollos stayed in their home while he was there. They took him aside, it says, and showed him the way more accurately. And then he, and then he wanted to go to, to, uh, to Greece and so uh, uh, Aquila and Priscilla wrote some letters and said, oh, you, you've got to go. Now, what's behind all of this? Aquila and Priscilla had heavenly vision. They saw the church of Jesus Christ. They saw Jesus Christ in his church. How? Because they'd been there when the church had been built by Paul in Corinth. And they opened their house there in Corinth. But the thing was, they saw the living Church, Christ Jesus, the organic reality. They saw the body of Christ ministering. They saw the Holy Spirit moving in oneness through the body of Christ in Corinth. And so Aquila and Priscilla said, let me show you the more accurate way. Did you know there's a baptism of the Holy Spirit? He said, what? He said, yes. The Holy Spirit baptizes you into the body of Christ. The body of Christ? What's that? He said, it's the church of Jesus Christ. He's now connected with it in a spiritual unity. And, and, and they told probably uh, Priscilla, uh, knew what she was doing, 
Aquila stood around and, you know, said, you want, want some more coffee? But I, I think Priscilla probably had the goods. Then Priscilla preached to him and told him the more accurate way, and he immediately wanted to go to Greece. Why? To see this thing, which actually wasn't happening in Ephesus yet, you see. And when Apollos got to Corinth, can you imagine what he saw? He saw people being led by the Holy Spirit. He saw the body of Christ. He saw that some were prophets and some were teachers. Some were speaking in tongues. Some were interpreting. What is going on here? And he saw it. He saw Jesus. The Jesus he had been preaching. Now he saw Jesus in the body. It was revolutionary for Apollos. And so he stayed on in Corinth and greatly helped the saints. Because now that he saw what the end was, his preaching could be directed properly. Not just bringing Jews into a synagogue as messianic Christians, but bringing them into, into the body of Christ by the baptism of the Holy Spirit where they could function in this new organic temple of God. Wow. What a time that must have been for Apollos. Huh? Well, for me, I had seen many revelations. You know, I, I, I read every book that watch, it was, was printed by Watchman Nee and CFP, and every time one came out, I read it. So you can't read that stuff and have a heart for the Lord, which I had, and not see revelation. But, you know, the difference between vision and revelation is I had revelations of Jesus, but there was no vision that had me. When you receive heavenly vision, it grabs you. You can receive revelations, but vision takes you. And I wasn't there yet. I saw precious things about the body of Christ. As a matter of fact, I was then a pastor. By then, I'd left the Baptist church. It's another story. And I was a pastor of an interdenominational church. And I tried to put into practice all of the methodology uh, in the normal Christian church life, things like that. Now, it wasn't working so great. But I, as the pastor, I was directing and ordering everything, you know, trying to get things going. But uh, I still hadn't seen that heavenly vision, that comprehensive vision that makes you understand what the Lord's doing. Overall, what's the Lord doing? You know, <laughs> I just really didn't quite understand. Now, the fact of the matter is this heavenly vision that Paul says I was not disobedient to there's only one vision. Isn't it interesting there in Acts chapter 2, when it talks about the early church, it says that the church continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching, singular. Now, sometimes Peter spoke, sometimes James spoke, sometimes uh, uh, Nathaniel spoke. But it didn't make any difference. The apostles all had one teaching. It was, let me tell you who Jesus is. Let me tell you what Jesus has done. Let me tell you what Jesus said. And, and it was all about Jesus, focused in Jesus, talking about him sitting on the throne of God now, and the church. I mean, it was one apostolic teaching because they were all under one vision. There was a unity there. But that heavenly vision is a unifying vision, and I, I wasn't there yet. I didn't see this comprehensive heavenly vision. What is that heavenly vision? Do you know? Have you ever seen that comprehensive overall vision to understand what God was doing? I hadn't seen it. I knew that Christ was Lord, that Christ was Lord at all, but I hadn't seen Christ in a vision like Isaiah saw Christ sitting on the throne. I knew that the church was his body, but I'd never seen that incorporated together in Christ, which is part of that vision and I hadn't heard my call within that plan. And you can tell when somebody has received the heavenly vision because there's suddenly reins are put on your life because just as it says, without a vision, people are unrestrained or perish. So when you receive vision, you're under a restraint. You don't just do whatever you want anymore because there's a vision determining what you should do. Right? Well, like I say, I wasn't there yet. Now... I'm going to spend a couple of minutes just talking about Baptist vision. This is because most of you have no idea what I'll be talking about. You, you think I'm speaking in tongues now. 
because thankfully most of you come from a Christian testimony church or something where they've experienced and touched something of God's eternal purpose. But I was a Baptist and that was my experience and so that's what I'm going to share. I was the pastor in a Baptist church and that involves all the usual things. The buck stops with me. I made all the final decisions and I got the money. That's right. So Sunday morning came, I got up, the congregation's there, I greeted all the people. And then I said, let's invite the Lord into the meeting. And I prayed the invocation. And then after that, I selected a hymn according to the, God, you know, according to the message I was going to preach. And we sang a hymn. And then I prayed especially hard for the offering. <laughs> and then after that, I preached the gospel. I gave an invitation. You know, Baptist Church, we gave an invitation for people to come forward every Sunday. And then I prayed the benediction. And then I ran out to the door so I could shake everybody's hand who was going out. Now, this, this is the normal way. Uh, you know, later on, I became part of a full gospel church. And, and so now I had my guitar, and I led the worship for a half an hour. Song after song, I picked a song. Everybody sang. It was standing up, praising God, and there was this ringing, 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 you know, my guitar for half hour. I led the worship, and then we prayed, and then I preached the gospel message, and then we gave an invitation, then I played a song, and we all went home. So, that, so it's still kind of the same thing. Now, you see, most people would say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, God blesses that. I mean, you know, when there's a good preacher or something, God blesses it, but what is wrong with that? See, I had no idea. If you had asked me, do you sense anything wrong about this? Well, of course, I guess I wouldn't admit it, but uh, the truth of the matter is, it was my show. Now, I would always say, I'm the under-shepherd, and Jesus is the shepherd. Now, I, I, you know, but everybody called me Pastor Dana just the same. But what was wrong? What was wrong? Here we go. Listen. Where was the body? You see, I didn't see the body. I was the body. I did everything in there, I'd, but I was the paid guy. So that's why I had to pray the invocation, I prayed the benediction, I, I gave the message, I gave the invitation. It, it's because, where's the body? And here are these dear saints sitting here and there, and they, they're, many of them giving sacrificially. And then we come to Wednesday night prayer meeting, and I'd open the prayer meeting, we'd sing a hymn, and then I'd preach on something on prayer, and then we'd, I, I, then we'd mention some items of people who were sick, and then I'd pray a prayer, and maybe a deacon would join on that, so there was some body life there. And then we would have a final prayer and go home. Now that's prayer meeting. And my dear saints who loved the Lord, they really didn't know how to pray in public. They didn't know how to pray. Now I, maybe this sounds very strange to you, but this is kind of the normal thing that, that I was involved in. There were so many man-made methods that I had no idea of all the things that was going on, all the ways we used flesh, you know. I remember one time, Ernie Heil and I, we were back in seminary, and we had, we, we had to go to preaching class. Well, let me tell you two things about preaching class. So everybody learned how to preach. There's different kinds of sermons and read sermons. And then one day, one of the famous Baptist preachers came in, and he gave us a secret a uh, scroll. And what it was is it's his sermon topics and scriptures for the next 52 weeks of the year. Now, it was wonderful. I mean, he had Easter there and Christmas and all of the seasons. And, of course, revival time in the fall, which came every year, and, and sermon messages for that. And it was already planned out, and he gave us a copy. I was set for the year. Now, what happens if God wanted to say something else? Ah, well, see, then we maybe have some trouble, right? You know, when the uh, Hebrides revival hit Scotland, Lance and his sister and a, a group of those in his Baptist church there in England, you know, Lance came out of the Baptist church, they went to the pastor, Alan Redpath, his famous pastor, and they said, Pastor, we want to see a revival like that in London. We need to have special prayer meetings and pray for revival in London. Can we, can we do that? And, and I'll never forget, Lance said, Pastor Redpath said, it will take us six months to clear our, schedule, our church schedule up so that we could have prayer meetings for revival. 
Now, you may say this is crazy, but I'm telling you, this is normal. So much goes on like that. But not, meanwhile, you preach the word. And people were helped and people got saved. We stressed evangelism, being filled with the Holy Spirit. We stressed revival especially, the deeper life, family worship, all kinds of things like that. So it's not all bad. But the vision was so limited. And I was very busy, like Apollos, you know. But I, I didn't have a heavenly vision. If you ask me, what is God's eternal purpose? I, I'd never heard that question before even though it's in the Bible. I, I didn't know it was in Ephesians. I, I never know. I probably would have said, Jesus is Lord of all. I mean, th that's probably a pretty good answer. Or what is God's eternal purpose? Getting people saved. Now, that's a winner right there. But I couldn't answer that question. I mean, <laughs> you know, well, anyway, uh, enough on telling you about all the stuff I was doing the wrong way. Let me tell you about God's mercy. <laughs> Somehow, I moved to Raleigh, North Carolina, and came into the orbit of our dear brother Stephen Kahn and brother Lance Lambert. Now, that was my undoing. I remember one of the first messages I heard from Lance, and he said, you know what's going on today all over the world? He says, everybody's got a, a partial idea about the church and what it's like. He says, it's like, he says people think the church is like a car. He says, now some people are saying, you need to buff the outside. You need to change the paint. Make it look nice. Just like the church building. We need stained glass. And we need, you know, better carpets. And this is what will draw people. Then another guy says, forget it. We need to preach born again. Get people saved. You need an engine. What good's a car without an engine? Until the Pentecostals come along and say, no, you need gasoline. What good does it have an engine? Got no, we need the power of the Holy Ghost to come down. People get filled. We need gasoline. And then some people say, no, 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 no. Before we take this car anywhere, we need to read the owner's manual. And these are the deeper life Bible teachers who like to teach all this stuff in the Bible. And then Lance says, so here are all these people vying for what's most important. And so Lance says, now what happens if somebody comes up and since says, now where's that car going? And nobody has any idea. Now, when I heard Lance give that example back in 1975, I had no answer. Now, I could say, oh, yeah, the church, they're going to heaven. <laughs> yeah. But I didn't, I didn't understand the, the purpose of the whole thing. Oh, my goodness, where is it going? I had no idea. Well, of course, by then, Lance was already sticking daggers in me. I was like a wounded bull. But of course, it was our brother Stephen who had to drive the, the sword in, being the Toreador that he was. Uh, I, I was there in Raleigh. I was a pastor of a church in Raleigh, but they had a small little group meeting where our brother Stephen came every month and spoke to these 20 or 25 people about, about higher things. And I was there, and he spoke one weekend from Revelation. And he spoke this scripture that we just read here about John seeing this vision of Jesus in the midst of the lampstands and looking at them. And uh, he put Jesus in the foreground and he said those seven lampstands were in the background because Jesus is the center of that whole vision. And then he said the lampstands were all of gold. It was pure gold. It was nothing but gold on those lampstands. And Jesus was looking at it. Now, I, I suppose you've heard that message before, here and there. But something happened to me the night after hearing that. And I went home. And I saw Jesus in the midst of the churches looking at my church. Now, when I saw that, I saw, as it were, with his eyes and his flaming fire, all that was wrong with the church. I saw my flesh. I saw it was my church. I, I, I saw so many things wrong, being done the wrong way. I, I can't even explain what I saw. But what happened to me is I died. 
because I saw I was completely wrong. I was the pastor of a church and I was completely wrong. I had no idea that he was building a golden lampstand. I had no idea he wanted all of gold, no compromise. I, I've read things like normal Christian church life, but I, like many ministers, I said, oh, this is wonderful. What idealistic teaching. But of course we know there's no perfect church. And based on that, we compromise. So you do it the Methodist way, I'll do it the Baptist way, you do it. Whatever way, just so long as people get saved. And I met a Lord that night who said, no, not your way, my way. I want a, a lampstand of pure gold. I don't want any compromise. And that uh, changed my life. And as I began to see it some more, I mean, the Lord began to show me his beautiful church. And it was like the scripture in Hebrews. It says, you know, Abraham walked through this life looking for that city whose builder and maker was God. And it's like I saw the church whose builder and maker was God. I saw the perfection of it. And it was so beautiful. This is what I wanted to see. This is what I wanted. But I, I had to die. Now I, that little group in Raleigh had no idea what was going on. I came down to that group and I uh, tore up my ordination paper in their midst. I resigned as the pastor. I started substitute teaching school. And uh, I had to learn all over again. Because I had to say at that moment, I see what God's after. I have no understanding of how to get there. I'm so full of the flesh and my ways and Baptist ways and ministerial ways. And the Lord basically said, I'm going to take you out of the ministry. And actually, I've never gone back. I got severely burned in that experience. I mean, severely burned. My whole career was over. I, you know, my pastor's annuity was gone. Career is gone. You study eight years to be a pastor. It's all gone. And, uh, and I'm so glad I did. Because slowly and surely, the Lord began to show me what he wants. Now, I know I'm saying this, and I know there's many people who, who are in those various different churches, and all I can say is God bless them. Because the Lord does bless a good preacher of the word. The Lord does bless people who want to be holy. The Lord does bless these churches to the degree that he can use them. And it's usually a matter of the parameters of the vision they have. And some that are more biblical have more vision. And some not so much and they're really compromised. But you know what? No matter what condition those churches are in all over this world, the Lord has overcomers in each of those groups. Somehow, they're faithful to the Lord. If the church has a gender problem and a, all of these kinds of things there are still overcomers who are faithful to the Lord they're serving in small ways they're teaching in the Sunday school they're doing all these kinds of things and the Lord's going to reward them so I have no beef with all that's going on around me but I just heard the Lord say Dana I want you to be part of something that's involved in that whose builder and maker is God and don't you take anything less and it, it started to be my restraint. And of course, you know, and the foolishness of all this, of course, you know, being a, a big guy and a preacher, people you know, think you're good. So, of course, I got invitations to go and pastor a church somewhere. Oh, we need, oh listen, brother, we need you over here. And I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. This was my way. And this was my way. I just had to say all the time, Jesus, what is your way? That's what I want to go. I want to go in your way. Now, as a result of this revelation, one thing, one of the things I saw so clear and I want to present tonight, it may sound a little new to you, but it's really not new at all, is I saw that God needs angels. To the angel of the church of Ephesus, right. And so on he goes as he speaks to the seven churches. God needs angels. Now, who are these angels? I know there's different opinions. I won't get into any kind of doctrinal argument with you. But to me, they're human beings, not angel angels. Human beings. Human beings who are part of that local church, whether it's Ephesus or Laodicea or Stars or whatever. But these are brothers and sisters. Maybe they're in the leadership 
But with the decline that you see in those seven churches as it gets worse and worse, maybe no longer in the leadership, but their brothers and sisters in his house that are willing to listen to him and repent and repeat what he is saying to the church. Now the Lord loves overcomers, but even overcomers need to understand what's wrong before they can overcome, right? I mean, if there's no angel at the church of Ephesus, how are you going to know we've left our first love? There's got to be somebody in Ephesus who's got the sensitivity of heart to say something's wrong, something's wrong. Even while everybody else is saying, no, no, we're doing great things, we're serving God, and we're preaching, and we're faithful, and we're finding out false apostles. But somebody in there says, no, no, something's wrong, something's wrong, because their heart is listening to the Lord. In the midst of all of the clatter, God wants angels. People who, who see the lampstand. Now, you know, I don't know how you picture this thing, but those seven, those seven lampstands, I don't actually see those lampstands so much in isolation because there's a whole house of God around it. But what I see is that Jesus is focused on that pure gold testimony. And that's what he wants. There is no perfect church. There's no perfect church. But there are those who want to hold that faithful testimony of Jesus without compromise because they've seen Jesus without compromise. And there are others who don't see it. The Lord's looking for angels who hold the testimony of Jesus. Isn't it wonderful? Could there be anything more wonderful about the Apostle John for, that, for, for the scriptures to say? He was on the Isle of Patmos for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Now that's an angel. John was an angel. And he was allowed to see these things. Because angelos, the Greek word, which we translate as angel in the scripture here, just means messenger. That's all it means. It means messenger. It doesn't mean this. It means a messenger. And the Lord needs messengers. But these messengers need to have a heavenly vision. They need to understand God's eternal purpose. Or they don't know where it's going. And it's the blind leading the blind. So what if they had a fight in the church of Ephesus over what's really wrong with us? Are, are we not finding out enough false apostles? Or are we not being faithful enough? And, and when all the time is they've left their first love. God wants angels who can prophesy God's heart, who are faithful messengers to whatever the Lord says. You may be very unpopular if you're an angel, but will you say what the Lord says? I think there's a great price for that. Because don't forget, Jesus goes on to say, let him who has an ear hear what the Spirit says to the church. Now the angels have spoke to the church. You know, they spoke to their local church. But now who is listening? Who is hearing? Who is that brother or sister who's true to him? How many times has an angel in a house of God been a sister who has such a clarity such a heart for the Lord. Well, back, back in the day, many years ago at the Richmond Conference, which, of course, I got hooked up with the Brother Kong and the Brother Lance. And I had to go every year to the conference. And every year, it was like the 4th of July, you know, just lights going off. I mean, every year I learned things I'd never heard in a million years. Listen, I'd been to a good seminary. I studied some books of the Bible in the original Greek and the Hebrew. I had some really renowned Baptist scholars as my teachers, but I've never heard anybody like him. Never. That, that, uh, that thing, uh, uh, seeing Christ in the scriptures, man, you, you couldn't get that in the best seminary in the world unless they're stealing his book. <laughs> I, was, you, you, I, I couldn't have missed those conferences for anything in the world. Anyway, so my kids are growing up, right? And I'm going to the conference, and my kids are, you know, this Asian. There's a woman. Most of you don't know who she is. Marilyn DeVries. She was a woman from Raleigh. She loved the Lord. She saw things. All I can tell you is this. My three boys went through her class. I think she taught 7th and 8th grade. They never forgot a word that she said. She wrote on people's hearts. Now, there's an angel. She wrote on my kids' hearts. And even though they stray far from God, 
There's something written on their hearts by that dear sister. She saw clear through. I tell you, she could share scriptures in such a way. The kids, it just wrote it. They'll never forget it. I could ask my son. I know he's 52 years old now. I could ask him what uh, Marilyn DeVries said. I bet you he could spit it out. Here's an angel. We need angels. Angels in the Sunday school. Angels preaching from the pulpit. Angels praying in the prayer meeting. We need angels. People who, who pray. Isn't it wonderful when you go to a prayer meeting, one of our corporate prayer meetings, which can be so dry and <coughs> dull. And somebody with the full of the Holy Spirit prays a visionary prayer that just lifts us all up to heaven. Oh, I love those sisters and those brothers. They just make our prayer meeting. Because they see what they're praying about. They got the end in view. They're just not praying for Aunt Tilly's broken arm. As a matter of fact, everything they see, they see in this bigger context. Even if they're teaching a Sunday school class, the, 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 the fourth grade kids, but they're bringing in Christ on a bigger scale than the usual little pictures of Christ who pinned up there and everybody goes away knowing the Bible's lessons but not knowing the Christ behind the Bible lessons. We need these kinds of angels. They need to be able to overcome a lukewarm church. They need to be able to witness to the loss. You know, they're in every church, I'm sure. They, these dear folks, they give sacrificially. A lot of folks are so stingy. And these folks give sacrificially. Wonderful. To have that kind of vision, it can actually change a, a whole church. I remember one time, so back in those early days, back in the 70s, when I started going to the Richmond Conference, Lance let me talk to him, Brother Stephen let me talk to him. I asked him a million questions. And there was a church at that time in a, in a, in a city in North Carolina, a prominent city in North Carolina, not, not uh, Raleigh or where we were. And this church had uh, become a charismatic Baptist church. And then they had begun to hear Lance and they took the name Baptist off the front. Now it's just the name of the city church. I said, the Lance, isn't that wonderful? They're becoming like the church according to God's purpose. And he said, brother, they may be filled with the Spirit. They may be seeing some things. But he said, but they have to go through. No, he said, they have to go through. <laughs> I had no idea. What, what does that mean? They have to go through. He meant the whole congregation, from the pastor down, had to go through the cross and drop all of that churchy stuff and come back, brothers and sisters, united together in the body of Christ. Can they make it through? They didn't make it through. You know, brothers, sisters, in these last days, we need, we need these angels if we don't have a heavenly vision, if we don't see God's purpose, if this thing isn't before us, how will we know what to do in these last days? How can we follow the Lord to the end? And you know something, there's many, many who love the Lord, but they have no vision. But they would follow if they heard. Like myself, I was, I was a sucker for our brother's ministry. I and mean, every time I went, every month, I would go listen to my brother. And uh, he was killing me softly with his song, as the old <laughs> song goes. He was killing me. Every week, he was killing me. I never saw, I never understood how he got Christ out of judges. But he was preaching what became seeing Christ through the Bible uh, there in Raleigh at the time. And he, he found Christ on every page. I couldn't find Christ in the gospel sometimes. I mean, he, he anyway, it was such but he was seeing something larger than just that. Do you know what I'm saying? There was, something, uh, there was something that made all of his message one message. Start anywhere, it comes down to that. It's the same with Lance. Start anywhere, it came down to that. Heavenly vision. To see it is to see what God's up to in these days. You know, it's interesting how Paul says that. I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. I've thought a lot about that. I want you to think about the humility of what he's saying there. That here he is talking some 30 years, perhaps, at least 25 years after he'd been saved. 
And that's what he told King Agrippa. He didn't say, I've been faithful to the heavenly vision. Because that would have been a proud boast. As if I, everything I saw, I did, you know. He didn't say that. He didn't say, I did everything right by the heavenly vision. Because he couldn't even claim that. Paul knew more than anybody else that he was chief of sinners. And he made mistakes. All he could say was, somehow, through all my ups and downs and through my discouragements and through my mistakes and through my precipitous actions before the Lord wanted those actions and all through all of that, that heavenly vision continued to pilot my way. And I wasn't disobedient to it. Sometimes I strayed, but I came back to it. The Lord's mercy drew me back and said, no, 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 brother, that's not the way to walk. Walk this way. And he would come back. Because there was this controlling vision that, that, that in the end said yay or nay to everything he wanted to do. It was no longer up to him. He was a man under the restraint of heaven. And heaven was causing him to be a master builder of the house of God. Because when Paul built, he built with gold and silver and precious stone. He didn't build with wood, hay, and stubble. I was a pastor building with wood, hay, and stubble. Because I didn't, I, I didn't know the gold of the, of the lampstand. I didn't, know, I didn't know Jesus really meant it when he says, I want the church pure. Gold. I want gold all the way through the church. I, I don't want any compromise. Now, there's not a church that isn't compromised. That's why he's always recovering things. But he's looking for some in that church who say, we don't want to compromise, Lord. Help us. We've got so much to undo, so much to learn. But Paul was held by that heavenly vision. Now that's really all I want to say except just one more thing to, by way of explanation and it's this. Heavenly vision, if we talk about it in such a kind of a abstract way, you might get the feeling that only Paul and uh, Isaiah and John could ever see a heavenly vision. But the fact of the matter is that heavenly vision is actually in us from the moment we're born again. Now, God's plan is for this. We come into the church and we get saved and we see Jesus there in our spirit. We see Jesus in our spirit. We may not understand too much of him, but we see him. And then here is God's plan. Then you come into the house of God and you start to see Jesus fuller in brothers, in sisters, in the ministry, in the worship. And just like uh, uh, Apollos, you go from that, I know this, because you see, when you see Jesus in you, you know everything that comes out of that vision. Oh, that's right. Oh, well, of course that's the way the Lord would build his body. Well, of course that's the way the Lord would minister. And in the body of Christ, we should see the Lord. And when we see the Lord, it, our, our vision expands. Now, there's very few people who can say, I had a road to Damascus, lightning from heaven, I fell off my horse, I saw the whole thing go down the drain and then the whole thing picked back up in a great, grand, heavenly vision. But there are many saints by the grace of God that the Holy Spirit reveals more and more and more until you get it. The comprehensive overall thing, you get it. You say, ah! Now, uh, I'm so glad when I saw this that I saw and, and believe me, I, I couldn't have explained to you what I'd seen when I saw. I just knew I was through, so I, I quit my ministry. But in the mercy of God, of course, I went to the next Richmond conference. <laughs> and why did I go? I, the preaching was great. Lance and Stephen, one-two punch. <laughs> That's not why I went. You know why I went? Because I could see God's purpose sitting over those people. I could see God's purpose in these crazy guys like Kenny and Jerry and Mac and these young brothers, they saw something. They were being drawn by something. There were these dear old sisters. I remember one of the first conferences I went to and between the lunch and the ministry or something, there was a woman named Llewellyn, an old sister. She told me more about Jesus Christ in a 10-minute conversation than I'd heard anybody tell me in a year. She'd seen him. She'd been amazed by him. 
And she saw how he was working things out. Isn't that amazing? She just, I, I, I think she was probably, you know, a typical Southern mom. I don't know if she worked on a job or anything, but man, she was smart. With a heavenly smart. It was amazing to see. And then, you know, by the grace of God, and I can't get into this whole story because it's just too amazing. Uh, somehow I got over to Halford House where Lance was, and we held, held gospel meetings there with my father-in-law and a whole team of about 15 or 20 brothers and sisters and my wife and everybody. And we were over there, and they had a wonderful time. And people got saved, and they were so refreshed and so blessed. But the last Sunday, the last meeting we had at Halford where Lance was, I stood up with my guitar. Back in those days, I always had my guitar. I, I didn't just talk at my guitar. So they wanted me to sing a song, so I was getting ready to sing. And I looked out over to these people. I, 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 they, they had a worship service that just absolutely blew me away. I'd never been. I'd never heard people singing like you sang tonight, honestly. Baptists don't sing that way. Anyway, not, not a lot of them. And, and anyway, I, I, I was just so touched by, they, they had it a scripture, and then they had a prayer, and they had a song, and it all fit into this tapestry that our brother Daniel was talking about. I, 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 and I looked over the congregation, and I said, you know something? I found home. This is what I want. And, and that's when I went home and, and it was all over. I left that ministry and I was a pastor and everybody misunderstood and I, I had to change everything around. For a couple of years, I didn't really minister very much because I had to learn the Lord's way of doing things. It's a lot, lot different than the ministerial complex and stuff I had learned. I'm telling you, it's a lot, lot different. You say, oh, it's practically the same. No, it's not. Listening to the Lord. And even being willing to say, somebody say, okay, brother, you got something to share? And to be willing to say, no, I have nothing. I'd never done that before. I always have something to share, even if I have nothing to share. <laughs> but now to be a brother in the body of Christ, just one of them, I share if the Lord give me some. Or, you know, we, we had some brothers there in Raleigh. They, they were... They, we had a crazy scientist. He wasn't really even that linguistically. He was challenged. Expressing things didn't make any difference. He saw things. When things started going a little bit off in our fellowship life there in Raleigh, he said, ah, 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 something's wrong. You say, what's wrong? I can't tell you, but the, something's not right. Sure enough, we were getting out of the Lord's way. He had another guy there. He was a, another guy. He was a, he was a florist. But he knew the way of the Lord. And the church kept in the living way. And he knew when things were getting off. Because he, he saw something. It's this heavenly vision I'm talking about. It's that which once you see, you never forget. And once you see, it aligns your life. Or begins to align your life. And that's what I'm praying for all of us here tonight. I, so I was so glad I got to go to Halford and go to the Richmond Conference and see these things in action. To me, it made such a difference. So in seeing Christ, of course, we've seen the heavenly vision. The church is in there. The kingdom is in there. The house of God is in there. The bride is in there. God's eternal purpose is in there. But as Paul said, I saw Jesus on the road to Damascus. I wonder how long that heavenly vision took. What do you think? Under five minutes, I would say, however long it took. Under five minutes to have that dialogue with Jesus and see the absolute glory of his new Lord, and yet he went back home, and then he said, Christ revealed himself in me that I can preach him. So even with what he'd seen here, it had to be seen here. And the heavenly vision the Lord wants us to have as angels is something we see here and see here. We need angels. We need those who see the Lord holding the lampstand in his hand. <laughs> That's another thing I saw. It wasn't me. It wasn't my church. It wasn't me holding the lampstand. It's the Lord holding the lampstand. Get your fingers off there, Dana. Felt like the Lord decapitated me from being a false head in the church. Get your hands off the lampstand. Brothers, if you're in a church and you got your hands on the lampstand, you got to fight with the Lord. It's not consistent with his purpose. He's jealous for that gold. He wants all of gold. But he's looking for angels. You see, not all overcomers are angels. But overcomers are those when they hear God speaking 
through angels who've seen, they'll repent. They hear what the Spirit's saying to the church. That's what makes overcomers. There's no church where if the angels speak, we don't sense something's wrong, we don't repent and get the things right. But it takes angels to understand what is wrong. Otherwise we say, ah, there's something wrong. I don't know. Nobody knows. What's wrong? I don't know. You know? No, I don't know. Something's wrong. Well, we always say something's wrong. But we need angels, people who see. Dear brother, dear sister, have you ever been confronted by a heavenly vision that reshaped your life? doesn't have to be a road to Damascus experience. But if it lays a hold of you in a true and living way, it becomes a deciding factor in all that you do. And that vision holds you, and that vision keeps you. As Paul said all these years, something in that vision kept me going this way. Look at the price he paid. It made no difference. He, he saw what he's after. Do you see what you're after? That's what, Paul, that's what Paul says in Philippians, right? I see what I'm after. Do you see what you're after? Or is it just earthy stuff? The Lord's looking for angels. People who can minister out of heavenly vision. Let's pray that might be our portion in these days. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we're so thankful that in those seven churches, and indeed we believe in all the churches of God, there are those who see, those who you've given wonderful vision of yourself, your final purposes and what you're up to. I pray, Lord, out of this group of young and promising servants, that you'll bring them into such a heavenly vision that it will conform them to your will without compromise as best we know how to walk. We know there's not a perfect church in our midst. Oh, but Lord, we want those who've seen the city in heaven. They know who the builder and the architect is. Oh, Lord Jesus, lay hold of us with heavenly vision, afresh and anew. Let us not talk about heavenly vision or eternal purpose out of some kind of a sense of doctrine, but out of a sense of reality, having seen, having been there. Oh, Lord, take your consecrated servants, your bond servants, and even as you showed your bond servants that revelation in Revelation 1, Lord, for these last days, we need your revelation again. Raise up angels, we pray in Jesus' name.